Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Frank Rasulo. I'm a associate professor at the Spedale Civili University Hospital of Russia, Italy. I thank uh, everyone for uh, participating in this meeting and uh, thank the organizer, organizers for the invitation. I have no disclosures or conflicts for this talk. Rather than an assertion, I think we can start by a question. Can I invasive ICP monitoring be inserted by ICU doctors? Well, we used to ask this question in a similar way when we were speaking about chest strains. Chest strains used to be inserted by surgeons, and fortunately, uh, we also started inserting chest strains in uh, intensive care. And uh, nurses are now, trained nurses are inserting chest strains. And this is serves and is necessary to save time and to treat life-saving situations. The same for surgical tracheostomy. It used to be a surgical procedure until Pat uh, Chalia performed the first uh, percutaneous tracheostomy in 1985. And ever since then, tracheostomy has been performed uh, in ICU by intensive care physicians rather quickly and frequently, and it has evolved through the years. But still, the question remains, why should we do it intracranial? I'm speaking about invasive ICP monitoring when the neurosurgeon can easily perform the maneuver and when the neurosurgeon is, is available. Well, speaking about availability, let's just take a step back and look at this uh, survey performed in more than 2,400, uh, among 2,400 neurosurgeons pertaining to the American Association of Neuro uh, Neurological Surgeons. They uh, actually, the result of this survey was that one half of the neurosurgeons prefer not to care for trauma patients for various reasons, conflicts of uh, elective practice, lack of compensation, and, and whatnot. But on the other hand, they still believe that small invasive procedures should be performed by neurosurgeons. So there's kind of a conflict of thought there, and this may translate into a delay in ICP monitoring. So who is performing the maneuvers? the uh, maze of ICP monitoring, well, the house officer, neurosurgical house officers, guided by the neurosurgeons themselves, can or and are performing the maneuver. It's also a maneuver quite easy to teach and to be performed by a neurosurgeon who is, who is being trained, especially in the early phase of his career or her career. And it's also being performed by surgeons, non-neurosurgical surgeons, um, especially in uh, rural areas. And not only are these surgeons performing invasive ICP monitoring, but also crane, small craniotomies, again, for life-saving maneuvers, especially where neurosurgeons in areas where neurosurgeons aren't easily available. Mid-level practitioners are also being trained to perform and to assist neurosurgeons in uh, performing these maneuvers, and they're also capable of performing ICE invasive ICP monitoring. And obviously, it's what my talk is about, intensivists are and have been performing, not many, but um, some centers do have uh, the intensivists themselves perform invasive ICP monitoring. But are there any benefits in terms of complication rate resources and time? I will be speaking about intraparenchymal invasive monitoring and not extra uh, ventricular drainage insertion, because I know there are uh, some intensivists who do perform uh, EVD insertion, but I will concentrate on intraparenchymal since intraparenchymal invasive uh, monitoring is correlated with a less uh, complication rate for obvious reasons. Uh, regarding the intraparenchymal maneuver, um, there are series which do show that twist drill itself has a low complication rate. For example, this is quite an old study, uh, but uh, 1,032 tristrial procedures were performed and there were only 0.38% complications, especially uh, bleeding, but none of these bleeds actually required surgical uh, evacuation. Regarding the complication rate and the confrontation between the maneuver performed by uh, intensivists and neurosurgeons, we actually performed two studies in our center. One was 20, was performed 25 years ago, where the experts at the time, there were two experts, performed the uh, maneuvers on the invasive maneuver in 180 patients. The second paper actually confronted the first two periods where the uh, experts trained a 
team of non-experts into performing the maneuvers and they confronted the complication rate. And what they see in that there was basically no difference between the experts and the non-experts. Therefore, it's a very easy maneuver to perform and to teach. And there are four bleeds, two of which required neurosurgical uh, intervention and one catheter related uh, meningitis where the uh, culture was positive. And this was actually during the first, the first series, therefore 25 years ago. However, interesting to note that the complication rate was not different between the intensive care physicians and the neurosurgeons. Again, why should we do it? Well, if we're talking about intracranial pressure monitoring performed in the ICU, this can avoid having to transfer the patient. In our center in particular, I know not all centers perform EVD insertion in uh, uh, the OR, but in, in uh, our center, we do perform EVD insertion in the OR. There will, therefore, this would require for the patient to be transferred to the operating room. Uh, being able to uh, in, um, insert an intraparenchymal monitor, which could be performed bedside, has the advantage of not having to transfer the patient. Transferring patients within hospitals and wards uh, is correlated with uh, various types of complications during the, uh, the transportation. And also there's a time factor. We're looking at if time can be saved by performing the maneuver ourselves. Now on this note, we're performing a study, which is still going on, where we looked at two different time phases, where the two different categories, the intraparenchymal catheters being inserted by intensive care physicians versus uh, in, in, in intraparenchymal catheters being inserted after neurosurgical con a, a consultation, however, by the uh, neurosurgeons themselves. So therefore, the, we looked at the time span between the indication of ICP monitoring, that's T0, and the skin incision, and that's T1. We've included so far 103 patients, 67 patients by, uh, were, uh, had their invasive ICP monitoring. Now here, we're speaking about both intraparenchymal and EVDs by the neurosurgeon. And um, 36 mm, intraparenchymal catheters were inserted by the intensive care physicians. In our hospital, our uh, institute, we have two intensive care units where one intensive care unit, the in one intensive care unit, we are uh, the intensivist inserts the invasive ICP monitoring, and the other intensive care unit, the intensive care physician would rely on the neurosurgeon to insert the invasive monitoring. And regarding the differences between time T0 and T1, when the intensivist inserted the invasive ICP monitoring, I'm speaking about um, the in intraparenchymal monitor, there was a 52 minute difference between T0 and T1 then compared to when the neurosurgeon had to, uh, was called upon to insert the invasive ICP monitoring. In this case, both intraparenchymal and EVD. So 52 minutes were saved when the uh, intensive care physician inserted the monitor um, him, him or herself. Regarding the complication rate, now for the complication rate, actually we, we confronted the only category which uh, interested intraparenchymal uh, insertion. And between the intraparenchymal insertions by intensivists and neurosurgeons, there was no difference in the complication rate, which was again, quite low. So do 52 minutes actually make a difference? When we're speaking about dose of ICP, intracranial hypertension, it does make a difference. Dose in terms of the amount of the time a patient spends with high intracranial pressure. The higher, the more the time the patient spends with a high intracranial pressure, the worse the outcome. And this has been shown for many types of brain injuries, both epidural and subdural hematomas. The more time the patient spends with intracranial hypertension due to these pathologies, the worse of the outcome. And also this is 
not very recent, but in 2013, the latest uh, series which showed that in 60 patients, the uh, outcome was actually worse in patients who spend more time with intracranial, high intracranial uh, pressure. There is a, um, a trial, an ongoing trial, but performed by the group in Monza, where they're looking at the burden of uh, the dose of intracranial hypertension on, on patients at the time. I'm not getting, going to get into the maneuver itself. It's very, it's rather simple. And we must remember that if it's performed in intensive care unit, it should be less invasive. So small incisions should be performed and the bow should be inserted uh, in a small, rather small incision, therefore reducing the bleeding. He, personally, I tend to insert a double or triple both uh, so I can uh, use a multimodality monitoring system because we must remember maybe one number itself is not enough. We should use intracranial pressure monitoring associated when possible with other types of multimodality monitoring systems. It is our duty to avoid secondary injury and I believe that this can be done only through multimodality narrow monitoring. Remember, we're going towards precision medicine. This will, not, this will be covered by uh, other speakers during this series, but precision medicine nowadays, tailor-made medicine is fundamental. Therefore, in order to go towards my conclusions, intracranial ICP monitoring placement by ICU physicians is safe, can be performed at bedside, may save resources, may save time and therefore has the potential of reducing dose, the dose of intracranial hypertension and therefore possibly improve outcome. I understand that this is uh, my opinion and usually opinions are not enough and must be backed by evidence-based medicine. But in this case, that whatever trials we perform should not be con concentrated on who performs the maneuver, but rather than the time spent by uh, performing one type of maneuver compared to uh, the other. I thank you very much for your attention.